It's something that needs to be done for the future. The automotive industry really has no idea what the future should be. And that's when it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. I'm like, there's a zillion different ways to make cars that would be low energy, low environmental impact. What's up people? So a lot of you, or at least a few of you, know about my Omega car, high efficiency, recyclable manufacturing car concept. But I haven't said anything on it in a long time. So let's go look at it. This was back in, I think 2012 actually, that the idea hit me of just how badly we manufacture cars around the world right now. And as an example, cars today are really not much different than they were in the mid-1930s. They're still just stamped steel boxes with chairs bolted to them and reciprocating engines. They're idiotically inefficient across the board from manufacturing to driving them. They don't last very long. And we just have the ridiculous, you know, continuing consumer culture cycle that nobody can really afford and isn't good for anything. But that's my personal opinion. Feel free to argue all you want. Either way, I thought it would be much more intelligent to make cars actually be efficient. And not only efficient, uh, and if they're efficient, they're gonna be faster and cooler, uh, but also if you manufacture them in a different way, you could potentially make them recyclable, more sustainable, <laughs> you know, intelligent, things like that. And my thinking was, back then I was looking up a bunch of different materials and thinking of some experimental processes and to manufacture things mass produced. And that's when it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. I'm like, there's a zillion different ways to make cars that would be low energy, low environmental impact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that would be just as cool and even better. So me being me, I, uh, I like to jump right on things and do stuff. So I wanted to build a prototype that would be representative of a number of different manufacturing techniques that I could make a far more efficient car. Um, that just would be better for people and the world. The other thing I want to say to you guys right now, and come on, you can take a look at it while I'm walking all around here. Uh, keep in mind, this is a hand-built prototype I made, and the doors are not on, clearly. <laughs> I've got the doors in the other room. It's all apart right now while I'm working on it. Um, point I want to make to all you car guys out there, first of all, I drive a Dodge Viper, okay? I like cars, I like muscle cars, I like race cars, I like exotic cars, but they're all expensive and toxic. Okay, so most of the people on the planet can't afford cool cars or are struggling just to afford any cars. I'll give you an example on that. The, the average new car in America costs slightly more than the average person's entire year's salary before taxes, then before loans and interest and depreciation and everything. And then, and I wonder to myself, who on earth can afford any of these new cars. Like seriously, can anybody actually afford new cars? And are new cars even doing anything for us in the future? Or are we just putting more whiz bangy garbage on it to be able to try to sell it when the automotive industry is grasping at straws? That's beside the point. Actually, it is the point. But I wanted to do something that would be more affordable. You see, the thing about cars is they're getting more and more and more and more complex. That's the wrong way, they need to get simpler. If they get simpler and we're starting from the ground up intelligently, you can make a structure that's gonna be safer and less, fr frankly, like resources and time and energy to create. It'll be better for the environment if you actually make it. And now all you people are thinking, oh, Casey's being a starry-eyed dreamer. Yeah, okay, I know, I am. Because the truth of the matter is the entire industrialized world is built on steel and powered by oil. I'm pretty sure all you guys have heard the names Carnegie and Rockefeller, and we all know that old habits die hard, really hard. So the sad truth of the matter is, even though we totally can, build cars that are efficient and recyclable and great for the environment, they would be cool and people can afford um, and be really great, it's, it's not gonna happen. I'm sorry, it's not. Like, if I would have fully well realized this back then, you know, I don't know, I, I just had to do it. Somebody had to do it, I just wanted to show it. Uh, and right now it's in, you know, in the Genius Garage Design Studio so I can at least inspire some and teach some young people while I'm finishing it up. But the reason why I haven't had this out and driving and I've only showed it a couple of times is because I didn't know the, what the heck I was going to do with it. 
Well, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's cheaper or you can make things recyclable and better for the environment. It doesn't matter because you're never going to be able to produce it. The laws are set up to be the way our whole country and everything's been for the last century plus. So sadly, you're not going to be able to do anything with it. You could tinker around and do stuff with assembled vehicle stuff, but you're not going to change the world. I'm sorry, but you're not right now. You know, or, or is there going to be another country where they're like, yeah, we'll do it here. I, I don't know. But I had to build it, had to show it, and it's a concept that I, I care about and I believe in because... You can actually have cool cars and fun and have personal liberties as an individual for the betterment of a nation and the world and the environment. It's doable, but nobody thinks it is. It kind of drives me nuts. So I'll get off my um, high horse now with all those kind of things. And let's just talk about this car. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the materials I used in it because, you know, I got to keep some secrets to myself or how I did it. But I can tell you it's all hand sculpted. I did not use a computer or at least an electric one. I use uh, an electric chemical one, the one but sitting on my shoulders like everybody should be using. <laughs> Every, what I'm saying is all you en young engineers and builders and designers have the best computer you're ever going to have right here. Just use it. So it's all hand sculpted and done, um, which is fun because you can do the really you know, nice uh, curves and everything like that. I will say that there's a couple issues with the car after sitting for a number of years and fluctuating temperatures where it looks like it's got cellulitis because of experimental materials and processes that I did when it was handmade. So there's some thicknesses and things that don't work. So don't, don't mind that. I'll fix that next time I paint it and finish it up. The doors are butterfly. They hinge there. They open up to, uh, to show that. There's some things I want to do for the uh, structure and all. Um, I made the car a stick shift, a manual transmission, uh, partially because I'm an old school racing hooligan but also because a manual transmission stick shift is more efficient than an automatic gearbox and they're cheaper to produce, which is good for the environment and people and the performance is great too. Um, gauges in cars makes no sense. Actually, steering wheel's not here, I'm sorry. The steering wheel just has an iPad on it because our phones and iPads are far more powerful and easy to adapt than the gauge clusters and dashboards in a car. Why are we paying for all that crap when we've got it right on a cell phone? You could literally take a cell phone, stick it on your dash, and have all your gauge readouts and your navigation and not need to pay for any of that in a car. But we do it because it's old culture and old standing. I thought that was silly. The other thing is, of this car, the seats are actually not in it right now because the seats are these modular pieces of high-density foam and such that just fit, and I'm not sure if this is the left or the right, passenger, that's passenger side, whatever. But so this is like the lower panel and this is the headrest and these actually affix directly to the monocoque chassis. Because my concept with regard to that or the doing something halfway intelligent is that the human body only touches in certain places. There's also side pads here. So if you make a seat like this that can be modular, it can be beautiful, it can be cheaper, it can fit right into the uh, chassis so it's going to be stronger and better. But what you do is, if, if the person's body is in one location, then you would just adjust the pedals in the steering wheel. It's easier. You don't have to have a big, stupid, heavy seat that adjusts. It's, it's just better. And it's safer, too, because when you have it right on the structure, you don't have to have this massively strong seat like that. You're already in the strongest part of the car in the best place for safety. Also, with different construction techniques, and by the way, this is not a body on a steel chassis. Like, you really think I'm going to build it that old school? This is a monocoque. The whole thing is more than just a shell. It is the car, it is the chassis. Like, I mean, I can walk on this thing. You know, it's, it's a strong car because it's a monocoque. Uh, but because by its nature, I'm not sure if with the engine in it, but could just about float. I'm actually gonna repaint that so I don't really care. But because of the nature of being a monocoque, it's very good for energy absorption in a crash. So it's inherently safer in many ways. And it gives you the opportunity to build it in such a way to absorb impact. And also depending on the material science and how you do it, let's say the car was involved in a wreck, well then you just section off a quarter of it and then bond in the new section. It's simple, it's actually easier and better than stamp steel boxes you gotta bend and weld and paint and hope it doesn't rust and everything like that. So another fun thing, so this car <coughs> is actually internal combustion power. Now the reason being is, look, okay, 
Guys, I know electric cars are really cool. They are zero emission at the car. They're not zero emission where you produce the energy because you still got to get the energy to it. So they do solve some good problems like keeping smog down in places like LA or London or something like that. But there's new problems associated with it, as we know, and they can go into like lithium mining for batteries and disposing of stuff like that. So we got to think big picture with all this. There's still places in the world where having an internal combustion engine frankly works better because there's no electrical grid, okay? And you need to transport the, the fuel to get to where it needs to be. Whereas electricity, you've got to produce based upon the demand. There's no giant battery sitting out in the desert that we can just charge up and then charge your cars from. Like you have to produce the energy based on the bandwidth the grid. So there's still a need for internal combustion engines. And the reason I decided to power my prototype internal combustion engine and actually diesel, believe it or not, is because one, it's the easiest way for the world to understand how efficient it is. Because with this being a super low drag body and low rolling resistance, if you tune it the right way, you can still make big power by making boosts with the diesel, but you should be able to push 100 miles to the gallon. Some of the guys that run turbo diesel cars, and stick shift ones, Volkswagen being a big one, or Audi, those guys are getting great miles to the gallon with big steel boxy looking uh, street cars. Um, if you guys are some of those uh, high mileage guys out there, you know, tell me what kind of miles per gallon you're getting. But I think you can understand if you have a lightweight, super low drag, super low rolling resistance vehicle, what's gonna happen? Your performance is gonna be better. It's gonna be faster and accelerate faster, which is great. Uh, it's probably gonna look cool. Uh, oh, but also you're gonna get really high miles to the gallon. You're gonna be really efficient. You're not gonna have to use as much energy. So it's good for your wallet and it's good for the environment. And then if you actually produce a car where it takes less energy to create and it's simpler, you're being nice to the environment in the future. And if it's simpler, it's cheaper, which is nice too, because then maybe instead of just funding the stupid automotive industry, you can go out and you know, start a business, make the world better. I don't know, sit around and do some art, whatever, make the world a better place. So that's something I did there. But anyway, this is actually turbo diesel. And believe it or not, it does have a Volkswagen engine in it. Now, I have to point something out, Dieselgate. We all know that Volkswagen, or at least if I remember this correctly, fudged all the numbers for emissions and things like that, and it was the biggest debacle you've ever seen in the world, and it's truly indeed a horrible thing. So I really didn't want to say that I have a Volkswagen-based engine in this, although I'm modifying it and such, because of that reason. But the truth be told, in the United States, the reason I chose, is it's a like 1.9 liter turbo diesel originally, an ALH engine. That was about the most efficient or high mileage kind of engine you could really get in the States readily, or at least at my budget. So that's what I grabbed. Because I also wanted to show that you could take something that was production based, potentially made for a front wheel drive vehicle, and put it in the rear, which would make well for a performance based vehicle, as well as some of the efficiencies. Which is very similar to what Lotus does with the Lotus Elise and Exiges. Those are Toyota, if I'm not mistaken, engines, made for the front of a car, in the, but to put in the back. Which is not much different than like the Acura NSX was, really. Or the Toyota MR2. So there's that. The other thing too, obviously it's a liquid cooled engine, but there's no radiator in the front to make it simpler. The radiator is back here in approximately the same location in relation to the engine and drivetrain as it would have been on a front engine vehicle, but it's the nature of the way the air flows with the car. So obviously you have air flowing over the top and the sides and all that. And later we'll come back when I'm putting the doors on and doing the rest of the wiring and such. But as air is flowing underneath the car, if you notice where the seats are, with the monocoque structure, there's a nice curve here, which is the perfect inclination for the human body to sit in, but also on the other side of that, underneath, as the air is flowing, it can flow and have a more laminar flow up into it where the radiator is, so that's also underneath the car, the intake for the radiator, and it's smooth at the bottom. And then if you come look at the rear of the car, and come on look, and please forgive the, the, uh, the turn signals. <laughs> they're for testing, you guys might not like them, but they're not the original, the final design. It's open back here in the middle with holes in the monocoque to actually come in here so that the hot air can then flow out the rear and you get your cam tail effect so that the car can be effectively shorter but aerodynamically work as though it was a fully streamlined long tail. This being the intercooler, there's a panel here which goes over top of it, of course, 
It's got a window in it because I'm fancy. That's cool to look at. But a uh, big NACA duct sculpted up in there to have your intake. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll actually have a movable flap here so you can streamline it more or have more cooling if you need for performance. A little bit of a design cue, but also just testing that. Um, this isn't fitting real well right now because it warped. I'll have to uh, rework that. And then two, a little bit of just some ambient hot air from the engine bay to cool. This is actually the door release. So it's, you know, somewhere where it's not out in the airstream and this will be capped off. It does not have a rear window. There's no need for one. We have a high definition screen here, which will go in the middle. It gives you a full rear world visibility. There's, there's no reason for a rear window at all. Uh, and without having that, you're able to make a more beautiful design, uh, less expensive and less complicated, uh, and still have everything you need from the camera there as well. Also, side mirrors are stupid, um, which you gotta put on side mirrors for legality, but the side mirrors out in the Airstream, all, all they're doing is burning fuel. They really, really are. You can have tiny little cameras shooting outside and not be in the Airstream, so that's something I didn't like either. So I didn't want any door handles or any mirrors or any stupid things out in the Airstream. You want it to be as slippery as possible uh, to make that work. All the, all the lights are LED, so they're low energy, uh, long lasting. Of course, there's your fuel fill. It's only a five gallon tank. Uh, for testing, it's pretty neat. But the other thing too, so this one's turbo diesel, as I said, but it just as easily could be gasoline. It could be natural gas powered, or I could make even the prototype electric. So, but I started with it this way because the world really understands mild gallon a lot better than they understand the nature of efficiencies and how to measure an electric car. Should have answered that better earlier in the talk, which I didn't. But uh, this is the car I'm building, you guys. Uh, I just thought, it's something that needs to be done for the future. The automotive industry really has no idea what the future should be, and we're all clamoring over electric cars because we think that's great. When the truth be told, I gotta be honest, a Tesla isn't really built that much differently than other cars. It's still a stamped metal box with chairs bolted in it, and it's more efficient in a number of ways, but it's getting whiz-bangy, and they're just sold to people with a bunch of money, largely. They're expensive, and I know they'll produce more and they'll get down less, but there's still need in the world for cars that one are affordable for people and that work with the nature of our still largely consumer society that are not totally obliterating the environment. So that's what I was doing with this concept. That's why I cared and uh, that's why I'm gonna keep going. But I really like your guys' feedback. Uh, you know, your support does mean something to me and uh, I'd like to keep going with it. And finish it up, I, largely the reason I haven't is just because I just haven't had the inspiration to because I just don't think the world gets it or cares and there's not much we can do and that's really frustrating. So if there's anybody out there, I don't know, that wants to team up or gets it or wants to do something big, then hit me up because quite frankly, I'm getting really tired of being in the cornfields of Ohio just teaching really brilliant kids and not getting to do something big. It's driving me insane because this is just the beginning of what I can do. Like if I'm building full scale flying pterosaurs just for kicks, you can, you can tell I'm getting a little bored. <laughs> okay, full honesty, 100%. <laughs> I hope you guys like this. Maybe you'll share it and naturally like, comment, and of course subscribe. See you guys next time.